Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have a returning guest, Dr. Richard Allen White III. He's uh, been in virology for quite a long time. Uh, he has his own company called Raw Molecular Systems, R-A-W. So, Rich, thanks for coming back. How are you doing? Yeah, it's great to be back. It's always a pleasure to be on the co- on the podcast. Yeah. Well, this will be for the virus book. You know, I wanted you to be a co-author. You know, we talked a lot, and uh, you've got a lot of great insights into viruses. So, we'll go through the list of questions. But just for a brief intro, tell people uh, what you're doing right now. What's your research about? So right now, uh, we're, in, we're focusing on developing diagnostics and biotherapies to combat COVID-19, as well as repurposing bacteriophage or bacterial viruses to tackle multidrug resistance. Okay. Well, very good. Well, let's get into the questions. Um, the first one, I guess it's important because all the other answers that come from it, I think, are, are influenced by it. So do you think viruses are alive or contingently alive when they enter a cell, or are they just machines? Without a doubt, they're alive. Um, I believe in the kind of Pat, uh, Patrick Fortier's work from 2010 uh, paper is published. It definitely needs to republish, but basically the idea is, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, it's semantics. These things will continue to be there and they'll be there long before we're gone. And until, you know, our planet is engulfed by the sun when it forms a red dwarf billions of years from now. But I think generally viruses, what we've been doing in virology is we've been teaching virology wrong. And uh, Patrick's work has really shed a light on this. And in general, it, it goes like this. If you see pollen on a car, would you call pollen trees? Absolutely not. If you see a basket of eggs from a chicken, would you call those eggs chicken? Absolutely not. And so this is what we've been doing with viruses. What we've been doing with viruses is we've been saying the virion, the replication unit of the virus, is the virus. But really, the virus is the infected cell. In that, the minute a virus takes over, for classic examples like polio, enters, infects, and takes over the entire uh, host machinery, such that within 20 minutes of infection, uh, maybe even an hour in polio, right in that range, uh, the cell is no longer making cellular proteins. It is making viral proteins. So much so that the cell expresses these viral proteins on the outside surface of the cell, and then it can actually go and infect other cells. So you have cell-to-cell infection. This is found in HIV, uh, in this thing called syncyt- these mega cells called syncytium. And when you have very, very high titers of virus, you can actually see this phenomenon. Wait, what, what do you mean uh, the cell itself? How would it infect another cell? Well, it, 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 it has so many viral proteins that it goes out, uh, in the cases of HIV, it goes out and as a macrophage, goes out and hunts other cell macrophages. And then, you know, just kind of like a zombie from your favorite zombie movie binds it, and then allows virions to transfer much, much easier through the cell-to-cell based infection. So it actually brings the virions, the egg, sperm, or replication unit of the virus uh, to uh, healthy cells. And so... The virion, the particle that we see, that is the replication unit. It's no different from egg, sperm, or pollen. And that's what we've been calling the virus. The virus, without a doubt, is the infected cell. So so with that, it's pretty easy to say that viruses are alive. We know this to work out because, you know, generally another rule for life is that it has nucleic acid, at least biological life in our form. So that's another line of evidence. The other line of evidence is that that heredity, Uh, that's coded in the DNA, also uh, can evolve through natural selection. Uh, Rocks don't do this. Lava flows don't do this. They don't evolve through natural selection. So in order to be alive, you need to have nucleic acid and you need to evolve through natural selection. Uh, So much so that as well, uh, viruses can get sick. You can get giant viruses that get infected by virophage. And giant viruses, for all intents and purposes, have all the machinery required 
to be a functional cell, except a lot of the ribosomal machinery. So when you're looking at interobligate cellular parasites like viruses, viruses, you know, are just the most perfect parasite. Uh, if you look at something that's more eukaryotic, if that's the parasite, you look at, you know, something like plasmodia. It evolved from a green photosynthetic organism in the ocean and then eventually lost a lot of that machinery and became a parasite. But without the mosquito and without the mammalian host, it would not exist. So that whole line of evidence to throw viruses up under the under the water and say that they're not alive is in is ridiculous because they have nucleic acids they evolve through natural selection they just as all parasites do they lose genetic material and so much so that they've lost all the genetic material to be basically as streamlined as possible so without a doubt viruses are alive so a couple of methods that came to mind if uh, if i have an infected cell one way is that the viruses would multiply and burst out of the cell and the virions would then affect other cells. But um, you said if, if they infect a macrophage, they don't have to do that. They can literally take over the macrophage and use its normal cellular action to engulf other cells and infect them that way, right? That's correct. Yeah, this is cell-to-cell based infection. Yeah, there's a bunch of viruses that do this. And when you have viruses in very, very high titer in cell culture, you can see this. You see these mega cells that are from these uh, syncytia, is what they're, you know, as a perfect example of cell to cell based infection. So, the way we should teach virology is that viruses are the infected cell and they're without a doubt alive, and that virions, the particles, are the replication unit of the virus. In my course, that's how I'm going to teach it. <laughs> that's how I've taught it for the last decade. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, again, Patrick Fortier is the one who coined this thing. Again, it's semantics, but I think it's important semantics because to say that they're not alive, again, is ridiculous because nothing replicates <laughs> with nucleic acid and, and then evolves through natural selection and is not alive. And so I think it's time for viruses to join the pantheon of life because without a doubt. So, so if you look at lytic versus latent versus uh, like retrovirus endogenizing behavior. Right. You could then say a, par- a virus is a parasite if it's lytic, it's a symbiont oh. if it's latent, oh. and it's a super u- eukaryotic or a holobiont if it's endogenizes. Well, I don't know if it's a holobiont. I, I see that, okay, so we have two things here. So we have first, we have bacteria and archaea. And mainly the archaea uh, we're talking about are not the crinarcheas because the crinarcheids you know, for all intents and purposes, there's only two domains of life. There is bacteria and archaea. And we eukaryotes are heavily derived archaea. So we won't talk about the crinarchaeodes or the loci archaeota, all these other branches that look more like our cells to start. We'll start with bacteria. And so in bacteria, you have phage or bacteriophage. They, they can form both lytic, um, meaning uh, a virus that's in replicative mode that forms a particle and then goes out and infects other cells. Uh, they also do this weird thing in these things called temperate phage, and inside the genome they're called back, uh, prophage. Uh, just wrote an article about this, and the, you know the way I've, the way it's been called is viral life cycle, uh, viral cycles. But really, these are lifestyles. And I just coined a paper in uh, Cell talking about this. There are trends in microbiology, which is part of the cell family. So you then have this other weird thing to where certain phages have found this other way of replication, where they enter, they don't. Uh, they, in, they basically are plasmid-like elements, they're in, or they basically integrate themselves into the host chromosome. When they do this, they can replicate through DNA replication. And so they found a way to do this. And basically, every time a cell divides, the, the, the phage, the bacterial virus, replicates with them. And then there'll be some sort of trigger, like some sort of SOS response or uh, something the cell is close to death, and then the virus will enter a lytic cycle. This is classically how we describe the lytic lifestyle and the lysogenic or the kind of endogenized lifestyle that you mentioned. Now, in eukaryotes, um, you have this weird thing occur, and I've mentioned this before on the call, where you had this event where you had a giant virus infecting a protist, and this thing was called Crow-V, and then there was this awesome phenomenon where every time the guy tried to get in one MOI, one infectious virus per cell, uh, that the giant virus would vanish. And back to my evidence of life, uh, viruses being life again, in that the, this thing triggered a thing called a virophage. So the host 
has somehow endogenized this other virus that's like a small bacteriophage in a eukaryotic cell. It, the giant virus triggers the little virus to come out. It's assembled in the host cell and then comes back in and infects the giant virus and replicates using the same promoter and viral factories and takes over. So viruses can get sick. Eventually over time, the giant virus vanishes because the virophage is so efficient. And in the case of the Marvorous virus that infects uh, cafeteria robogensis and crow B, the virus that infects uh, the giant virus, the little virus then in, it has this retroviral integrase, which allows it to actually endogenize itself inside the host chromosome. So such that the giant virus ever appears, the little guy can come out and wipe it out. Now, now you've eliminated uh, to extinction the giant virus. Over time, you this maverick virus uh, eventually lost its way to package itself and it looks like maverick transposons. So the expansion of the eukaryotic cell and the kind of a beginning of, an, of a based immune system could have uh, kind of a small quasi immune system before you have adaptive or B cells or these other things uh, could have been this viral event uh, where you had, you know, viruses that maybe infected or parasited, were parasites of other viruses or they were parasites of the eukaryotic cell. Eventually they lose their packaging machinery and they become one with the host, allowing for rapid genome expansion, the evolution of new genes, and so forth. Do you think that, um, so like HIV, it has to endogenize, and then it can replicate itself, but <laughs> other herbs have endogenized and they've lost their replication machinery. At what point do you think an endogenized virus would still keep its agency, and if conditions are right, it might come out hmm. and de-endogenize or make new virions and you know, go lytic on the cell that hosts it? So this is a great question about HIV. So they're, I think they're green macaques and they base at, or rhesus monkeys, uh, both have resistance if I remember, or one of them has resistance, I, I would have to check again. And basically uh, it took about 115,000 years for these virus, for the host to uh, form resistance. And so if the host has resistance and every time it sees particles, for example, and it wipes out the particles, that's a strong selection on the virus that's inside the host chromosome. Eventually, such that it, it the virus somehow through, um, again, natural selection uh, and the selection pressure, you know, loses its ability to encapsulate itself. So then, you know, it becomes a herb. It becomes an, an uh, endogenous retrovirus that just expands the genome because there's the resistance there. And then eventually it doesn't package and then there's no real reason for it to do anything but it found a way to, uh, to replicate itself just like the phage only only uh, using DNA replication. So we don't really know much uh, is, if I remember I haven't done enough of my due diligence to really understand and I don't really know if it's really well known like what triggers the conversion from retrovirus to retrotransposon. but you know a large portion of our genome are retro elements so our species, there's a brilliant book on it, uh, has seen tens of, tens of hundreds of different retroviruses that we've dealt with in our course of evolution that eventually lost their ability to capsulate themselves, introduce themselves into the host, expanded, or just ceases to exist at all. So, so going back to um, an earlier question, so you were talking about you know viruses taking over macrophages and then they can do the cell-to-cell -cell infection. But since a virus can completely co-opt a cell, do you think they can use the cellular machinery to send out customized extracellular vesicles that are infective to other cells? You know, can they do this to bacteria and send out plasmids that are infective? You know, do they have to package other virions and lice a cell in order to infect other cells? Could this be so, yet another way they could do that? So I think a good example of this is not really vesicles. I can't think of anything quite like that. But I can give you an example of in phage where you have a defective virus, uh, these things called gene transfer elements. Uh, they were first identified in Rhodobacter capsulatus, which is an alpha protein bacteria. And it was weird. A uh, guy found this phage and he could transfer information uh, randomly back and forth in culture. He tried to purify the phage and every time he tried to purify it and run it out in a gel, it was, a, it was basically a giant lawn of nucleic acid, which was all. So it finds out there's this defective phage um, and it's found in a bunch of other, uh, there's a couple in, uh, uh, there's one in spirochetes, black aspira, there's a couple here and there. So eventually this phage uh, assembles itself 
and then grabs random bits of the DNA genome from the host and then basically gets itself out of the host and transfers random bits of DNA to its closely related organisms in, in the same species. Uh, so this is a way that a virus can transfer genetic information without, at, with you know, infecting a cell but not replicating itself. And so this is a, another fine example of you know horizontal transfer that's being done through phage, but not through either entering and integrating itself inside the host or becoming lytic and killing the host. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Well, how far does the control go? Do you think, let's say, you know, I, I was going to ask you, why is there, um, you know, a, from first infection to pathogenicity, why is there a latency period? Is it, you know, I know there's viral replication and it's exponential, but perhaps it's quorum sensing. Maybe the virus can, uh, when it's in cells, instruct them to do some kind of quorum sensing and say how many other cells are infected. Okay, there's enough, go. So there is a phage in Vibrio, which somehow is triggered by a quorum sensing molecule. So when the hosts are making a bunch of the quorum sensing molecule, the phage can somehow sense that there's enough of this molecule present and then it will infect the host. The likelihood is that it doesn't physically sense it, but yet, it, you know, and if it did, it would be absolutely fantastic. I don't even know how that would work. But the virus must require that the quorum sensing molecule must be uh, taken up by the host cell. And that must cause some sort of confirmation change to its receptor that then allows it uh, to enter. That would be my hypothesis on how that would work. Uh, it was a brilliant paper. I definitely recommend reading it. Uh, it, you know, you know that, that there is some sort of link between sensing of other cells and that viruses exploit that sensing. So what do you think causes uh, lytic versus latent behavior versus endogenizing into a host? And especially think, what triggers the back and forth lytic to latent I, well, you know, choice? So we've got a couple of different things here. So lytic and, and kind of lysogenic, that's a principle that's only found in, in bacteria and some Eurthiota archaea um, because they're more ancient, like with antigen. Um, and so in that case, it is just the phage found a way through natural selection that when times were bad, it could basically lyse itself out of the cell. When times were good, it could just do DNA replication. Uh, there's principles called kill the winner where the most dominant host is lysed and it's replicative and then you piggyback the winner when everything's kind of good you know the, the phage just kind of replicates in dna and you know i'm totally abridging it it's much more complicated and brilliant but how, but how could it how could it go back and forth between these behaviors without active sensing and discernment of environment and then action again it's it's the host cell triggers it and so when the whole cell uh, has a conformational change uh inside virus is triggered um, to replicate. Um, and through natural selection evolution, this has occurred. Now, the, between latency and latency is, is a eukaryotic virus thing. And latency is commonly found in the herpes virus family, uh, one of the most successful of all the families. And so this is kind of the S versus R strategist. Some basically, you know, you make lots and lots of offspring and, you know, if you get lot, if you make tons of offspring, you have a better chance in success, succeeding. This is kind of, you know, RNA viruses. They make tons and tons of offspring and they hope that, you know, they can hit as many hosts as possible. Now, DNA viruses found another strategy in eukaryotes, especially in herpes. They found that they can wait out in the host and basically hide out into the neural tissue <laughs> and just wait it out until the host is susceptible enough and then they can and trigger, uh, they can go out of this latency period and they can cause a lytic infection. And then that lytic infection can infect other hosts. But worst case scenario, it doesn't affect other hosts and it can go back and hide out once the immune system kicks it back. And this is just a strategy that herpes found. Uh, you know, CMV does this, uh, herpes simplex one and two, uh, you know, kind of the uh, general herpes found this. And this is a strategy for DNA viruses. They found that, you know, instead of having strength in numbers, or maybe billions of variants, they found that, you know, make a good amount of variants, but, you know, allow us to hide out and wait for the host is weakest. So the immune system can't kick us down 
and then you know infect and produce itself into a lytic infection and then infect other hosts near us. Now, HIV is completely different. You know, HIV does have a long latency, but HIV is that blend between DNA and RNA. It is uh, RNA genome, but it creates its, you know, double-stranded DNA genome and integrates in the host. And so retroviruses are fantastic in that they are all, they become part of you <laughs> forever. And there's six, and you can, they basically hide out and wait until you're least suspected. And in the case of HIV, you wipe out the immune system, you wipe out macrophages, you wipe out monocytes, you wipe out T cells and such. The host cannot defend itself. And, you know, other infections take over the host. I don't think it's it's what it wants to do. If it would, if we could anthropomorphize a virus, I mean, the virus just wants to replicate. I, I think a virus that kills its host is not successful in that it kills itself. It's kind of a self-destruct mechanism. I think when viruses enter a cell, their goal is to replicate. And in some of the viruses that I've, I've studied, uh, like the GB viruses, now human PEGI viruses, um, they, you know, infect cells, they replicate, and they cause no harm to the host. And so I think that that is a, a great strategy that a lot of viruses haven't adapted because they replicate so fast that they kill their host in the process. But I think it's, a, it's, an, it's an accidental consequence. I think for a virus, it just wants to replicate. It doesn't know any better, right? But and why it, does it want anything? Why, why is it anthropomorphizing to say anything and to, to talk about other behaviors, but to say that, oh, it just wants to replicate? That's not that, anthropomorphizing. Well, a want is kind of a process of man. It doesn't think. It just does. <laughs> so why bother, why bother replicating at all then? What's the point? Who cares? Why is there even a drive to do that? If there's, you know, it's, if, you, if you're saying it's alive, it, it has certain drives like any other. It's alive, it's biological, but it doesn't think. I guess that's the difference. You know, it, it just replicates because it doesn't know any better. <laughs> so, so of all the forms of viruses, you know, you get bacteriophages that look like moon landers, you know, with like a central collar and they screw into a cell membrane and they have tail fibers and then you got round ones with spikes, maybe like coronavirus. And you have all these different forms and also mechanisms of entry. What are some of your favorite craziest or weirdest entry mechanisms? And, and why do you think that viruses have all these forms and different ways to enter? Uh, I think that just, again, it's, you know, I'll uh, plead the natural selection evolution. It's just done a fantastic job in basically rolling the dice millions and billions of times. And so kind of my favorite is dengue. I think dengue is just so magnificent in, in what it does. And normally it kind of enters through its normal receptor, through classroom coat of pits and all these kind of other things. But when it, re, you know, when it basically repurposes the antibodies uh, and the antibodies bind to, to its proteins, and then it basically uses that as antibody-enhanced entry. I think that is just absolutely fantastic, you know, uh, in that it normally goes one route, but if you try to kill it, it will use your immune system against you. And so that is one of my, my favorites, actually. Uh, the other one I like a lot is um, the way uh, some of the RNA phage infect E. coli. Like I think the Cubeta and, or is it Cubeta or, or Phi-X? One, uh, Phi-X is a single strand of DNA virus, but they basically hop on the pili and they basically jump on the pili and kind of roll up and infect. And I think that is also quite fascinating. And then the classic one that's been beaten into my head for so long is the way HIV enters, you know, receptor mediated uh, fusion. Uh, and then an endocytosis in, uh, where it basically binds CD4 and CCR5 and macrophages, or it binds CD4 and and or C CXCR4 in T cells. Um, that's kind of the classic one I tell kids about. Uh, the new coronavirus is also fascinating in that it uses this enterotensin receptor, the ACE2. Uh, it also requires cleavage in order to enter, or the cleavage enhances the entry. But again, I think when a virus repurposes the immune system against its host uh, or its defense or the defenses of the host against it is, it, it just fascinates me. It's just like, ah, you got, you try to do, oh, you try to do that. Well, uh, you might have a king on the river, but I have the ace in the hole. So <laughs> I just love that. So do you think viruses uh, experience epigenetic marks like, uh, you know, oh, our absolutely. own cells do? Oh, absolutely. Uh, phage DNA is so heavily modified, my God. 
Uh, it's methylated. There's probably modifications in phage DNA we've never we've never seen before because if it modifies its nucleic acids, it can't be chewed up. So I think there is a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. And if you talk to the old phage guys, they would tell you all about it and how it would have been awesome to have this power and sequencing we do now. But you know, papers are being published almost every month about a new phage that has methylation or it has some sort of modification that doesn't allow it to be chewed up. And I think that is absolutely fascinating. So if, if viruses have that, what defines a, uh, I mean, I thought that just the, the sequence defines a virus, but uh, if, if you have a bunch of viruses and they're all marked differently after, you know, let's say post-infection, are they now quasi-species? Are they, what yeah, are they? Great question. Um, you know, there are all kinds of new RNA modifications. Are we, you know, that was the whole, pro- that was the whole thing with epigenetics uh, in humans. Like the kind of classical example was Peter Wilde and Angelman syndrome. You know, if you have methylation on one chromosome, you have a- from the dad. So Peter Wilde is from the father and you have a methylation that's given from the father on chromosome 15 and uh, you get obesity and intellectual disability and shortness in height. But if it's passed from the mother, you have Angelman syndrome, which is basically uh, another uh, intellectual disability. Amazing, you know, we see in something like humans. And so could viruses have, you know, do they have modifications? Absolutely. Do they remember somehow in a population? Do that, does it, the, the population change or do you have different groups? I don't know. That's a great question. I think if we studied phage in more population uh, genetics, we uh, in the context of modification, I think that those would kind of tease themselves out. But I think it's very interesting. Well, if I get infected by a virus, am I getting infected by one, you know, uh, particular sequence of virus, or am I getting infected by a swarm of, of viruses that have different modular differences in their sequence and they have different epigenetic marks? Like, you know, am I am I being infected again by a swarm of varying different ones and I guess it's that necessary. The virus, in the case of HIV, you're absolutely 100% infected with the population. Uh, if you have something like the COVID-19 virus, the population is relatively stable. But again, it is a, it, with RNA viruses, it's a consensus sequence. There are small variations in SNPs and maybe small variations in modification. HIV, for sure, you're infected with a population, and that population grows and retracts throughout the infection. So I would say that in general, you're infected with a population, but that population can be dominated by a couple main, main members um, that form that consensus. And then you have some that are very, very, very small frequency. Do you think that's necessary for proper infection? If I was able to make an isolate of HIV where it was all the exact same strain, you know, no marks on it or the exact same set of marks and I infected animal A versus like a normal, you know, population of them and infect the animal B. That what you start with is not what you'll end with, with HIV, because HIV, because of its RNA dependent RNA polymerase and the RT, it makes mistakes. So those mistakes are actually generated throughout the course of infection. So you start with one, you'll end up with a million new ones. <laughs> so yeah. And that's how viral evolution works, right? But like, you know, again, if you were able to make an isolate of some other virus, you know, let's say the coronavirus, you made Mm -hmm. an isolate. It was only one exact sequence. And then you just took a wild sample, which probably has different variants and infected two different people. Do you think there would be a more successful infection with the, the one that's a population of variants versus the one that's only exactly one sequence? I think, you know, the natural selection would favor um, the more variants, ones that had more diversity. That's the whole idea behind diversity. You know, so I would, I would, my hypothesis would be that if you started, if you had more just that you started with, you'd probably end up with more uh, and they could recombine or they could have SNPs. Uh, You probably end up with a more successful infection as a virus. I mean, influenza, Uh, you create new strains when the virus is multiple, multiple strains of the virus are infecting the same cell, like in the case of pigs. You'll have an avian virus and swine origin. You have four different viruses kind of, you know, infect the same cell at some point or infected one cell and then another cell got infected and you have a, a quadruple uh, recombination event, um, potentially, uh, that allowed for this creation of a new virus. And so 
the thought is, is that you have, you know, if you have more diversity, when you have a selection event, say if you had eight different colored penguins and four of those penguins would work um, out of those eight different colored ones and the four didn't, when you had a selection pressure and five died out, um, but the orange penguin will say is more fit, then the orange penguin would eventually take over. And so you had very little of the of the other two until it couldn't occupy the same niche anymore. And then it would wipe out the other two. And that's how uh, evolution through natural selection works. Uh, viruses put that on their head because they're kind of, they can, they can hide out, they can wait, they can be in the periphery. If, if I think of a colony of bees, you know, I got worker bees, drones, queens, etc. They're all the phenotype B, but they're all different and they all have roles and Right. Together, they, they help each other to be one genome, a colony of phenotypes. Yeah, insects are weird like that, especially uh, oh. insects, especially like bees and and uh, ants. You know, with one genome, you have five different phenotypes, and that's really interesting about about right. Insects. But with 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 a swarm of viruses with you know different epigenetic marks with different variations in its uh, you know nucleic acid sequence, is there something similar that happens? I don't think so. Not quite in the way it would work. Not that we know of yet. Do you think there's any coordination? You know, if, if I think of like a one virus, one target cell model, is there any examples of multiple variants coordinating entry, coordinating infection, that mm. type of thing? Not that I, not that I come up with. Uh, there is this weird one where you'll have two RNA phages infect the same cell and they supposedly independently sort and they keep themselves away from each other. We don't really know what that phenomenon, how that phenomenon works, where they don't recombine and they don't interfere with each other. At least it, this was done in the 1970s. But I can't think of any other way where this would be coordinated. No, not that I know of. If I, if I have a cell that's infected by a virus, uh, can it prevent other viruses from infecting it? Like a dog guarding a bone? That's a good question. I, I mean, in influenza, no, for sure not. You can get infected by multiple virons at the same time. You know, HIV, no. You can get infected with HIV and, and human peggy virus at the same time. I don't know of any examples of that. That's actually a good question. Hmm. Okay. How do you think viruses uh, are either a part of our immune system or coordinate with their immune system, or do they? You know, and I know for like a bacteria they seem to be an integral part of its immunity. You know, the bacteria taking viral elements and, you know, being able to survive various insults, uh, exchanging plasmids, et cetera, like cholera, you know, it's not infective without, uh, you know, a, a piece of viral DNA. But do you think it comprises like a bacteria's immune system? And do you think our virome contributes at all to our immunity? So I am, you know, there are lots of evidence of, viruses, uh, well, at least anecdotal evidence, um, more work needs to be done, but there is a phage that prevents uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It was published in Nature or Science, one of the big ones. And patients that had, uh, they did this experiment with, with and without the phage uh, that infected enterococcus. And when the phage was present uh, and they gave the mice lethal doses of ethanol to induce kind of a fatty acid liver effect, the phage protected their, their cells uh, from dying quicker and then they live longer. So there's definitely, a, a, you know, there's definitely cases of phage having protective elements as well. They have the, you know, I've coined this word, the double-edged sword, where you have phage that both are giveth and they taketh away. Uh, there are examples where the phage in, in, in infects uh, pseudomonas. And the Pseudomonas arginosa, if it gets on a wound, uh, the wound won't heal because the phage somehow makes the, the bacteria more virulent. And that's, that's common, you know, Verbia varia hemolyticus, the phage is what gives it the virulence factor, Shigella toxin in, in, uh, in Shigella and E. coli, uh, the phage are driving the virulence. Now there must be other examples. Um, the one that, like I said, that comes to mind and says non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, there must be many other examples to where there are bacterial viruses that prevent human disease and could act part of our microbial shield of the microbiome that protect us, kind of the first line of defense. They're the, they're the defensive linemen, if you will, of, of pathogens, <laughs> right? Um, but there are other ones that are, if they infect certain pathogens, they cause more serious disease. So both exist. 
Now, are there viruses in the eukaryotic viral sphere that prevent us from dying? Uh, the classic example is the one I worked on my master's where it's, uh, this is originally called GBVC originally. Uh, I was, prior to that, it was called hepatitis G. Basically, they found this guy with a very serious form of uh, hepatitis, uh, died very quickly. He was a surgeon uh, named GB, and he was co-infected with hepatitis G and hepatitis C. Uh, Abbott and all those guys were very worried about blood and worried about uh, in the mid-90s uh, because of the rise of HIV and to find other viruses that could be causing disease, and then hep C was discovered, uh, and they worried that hep G would be a problem. It finds out hep G, it does not, it's not a liver pathogen. It doesn't replicate in the liver. It's a electrophic virus. It replicates in the similar cells, uh, T cells, potentially macrophages and def and most, most likely B cells. Uh, so Jack Stapleton's group out of Iowa State found that this virus, and there was another group as well uh, back in 2012 that found that people that were infected with uh, uh, then GBVC, now human Peggy virus G, and probably 10 years from now, they'll name it something else <laughs> because that's, it seems what every 10 years they name it something new. And so uh, this human Peggy virus in the presence of HIV, even with, with and without highly active retroviral therapy, which is the uh, heart therapy for HIV, people live longer. Um, and so, um, and there's probably a variety of reasons. Their reasons was increases the cytokine storm. Some of the anecdotal information uh, on my end uh, seemed to have uh, increased interleukins that were uh, anti-HIV. There's lots of work to be done. Uh, there's been work done in chimpanzee with, the, with this as well. And there's a chimpanzee model, finally, I believe, for a uh, recent cat to where we can infect um, HIV and human Peggy virus G into the same uh, animal model to actually really understand its immunology and its infection. So the idea that, you know, most people probably have antibodies to human Peggy virus G, if not, maybe one in a hundred will have active infection or even maybe one in a thousand will have active infection and not even. That. So, um, you know, the idea is that this is an example potentially of a good boy virus, a virus that doesn't kill its host. And so, again, uh, if you look at bats, you know, and Ebola, uh, you would say that Ebola is not a bad guy in bats. It doesn't kill the bat. The bat basically found a way through uh, evolution because it's flying and it needs to not make a bunch of free radicals and it's toned down its inflammatory response. And so in doing that, it can host you know, thousands of viruses, coronas and paramyxoviruses and Ebola and never, never get sick, you know, never get, oh. cancer, you know, uh, they can get wiped out by fungal infection uh, because they don't have that pro strong pro-inflammatory response like we have, but that pro-inflammatory response is the reason why a lot of people die from COVID-19, the ARDS, it's the inflammatory response in the neutrophil storm that causes their demise, not the virus. Same thing with polio. It's the immune response to the polio that wipes out the, the autonomic nervous system in polio. So um, if we could figure out how to way to dial down the immune system and some of these infections, and I think one of the therapies now with COVID-19 is to dial down the immune system considerably in that, you know, giving it anti-inflammatories and anticoagulant drugs so the blood doesn't coagulate and it doesn't have an hyperimmune response, hyperimmune response. Right, right. So well, let's, let's, yeah, let's get back to this thing. Bats and how they deal with viruses. And, you know, the, you know, once we figure that out, then the question is where do the viruses come from in bats? You know, the kind of hypothesis in my mind is they may have come from insects and then they jump into bats, but we don't know. Um, you know, they don't, you know, maybe they magically appear. I don't think they do. Um, I think there is some processes that occur in other organisms. And when they jump into other organisms, um, you know, they create new viruses. So, yeah. Well, what happens if, uh, you know, I know I'm in the jungle and a, a bat latches onto my neck and bites me and then I get some virus and then, you know, I come home and I cough all over you and I get you sick. Uh, you know, I'm number one. I first got it. You're number two. And you go on to infect someone else and on and on and on. Yeah. And it gets the number 100 in this passaging chain. How do you think a virus will be changed after it's gone through that many different uh, hosts? Well, I guess it depends. Um, kind of the example that comes to mind is, you know, is uh, the original SARS, right? The original SARS, it had recently jumped into civets 
So probably bats obviously infected the civets and then which are these kind of cat-like animals. Uh, and then it infected a farmer or a civet handler. I don't know what you would call that. Um, and then those viruses were almost 100% identical. Um, they were 99.9% identical. Um, and then it's high lethality um, kind of, you know, didn't allow it to spread. Uh, these coronaviruses, they adapt to new hosts relatively fast. They can jump from us to dogs, to, to tigers, to, you know, to cats. Uh, there was a preprint just published about how potentially cats and dogs have tons of antibodies to these new coronaviruses because their owners are exposing them to it. You know, the cat and dog or tiger or these other, you know, ferrets and, you know, minks and all these other pangolins, you know, all these other mammals. And it, it seems to take you know, just a couple of rounds of infection and, you know, the virus adapts itself very well to its new host. This is just very odd uh, for viruses because most viruses are pretty selective in their hosts. You know, with the case of HIV, originally it was in chimpanzee, SIV, CPZ, you know, it uh, jumped into us because we were just close enough. And then over time, it was able to evolve and adapt to us um, because it has such a high error rate and it allows for rapid mutation that it can be, you know, fine, you know, it's basically playing roulette, you know, it finds the best virus and that virus then propagates itself and then it's able to transfer. So because RNA viruses, again, have strength in massive numbers, it only takes, you know, a handful of that population to order to be infected to the new host. So, so do you think there's a tropism to transmission matching? So like rabies, you know, like the dog bites me, I get rabies, then I want to bite someone else and give them rabies, you know, uh, <laughs> flu, really, uh, rabies, on me, I cough on really, them. And it really is an interesting one. Rabies is fabulous in that it's the, really the only one of its kind. It looks like a bullet, you know, and fabulous in that it's neat looking molecularly, not that it's fabulous that people get it. Obviously that's, <laughs> you know, it's very unique in that face, uh, there is new treatment now where they, for rabies, um, they originally called rabies hydrophobia in the time of uh, Louis Pasteur, right? Because they would try to give people water and they were scared. And that was because they were not all there because they were suffering very strong um, mental issues of, of the autonomic system. So they thought that they were afraid of water back in, you know, 200 years ago. But now there's this treatment now where people can get infected if they don't get the vaccine right away. They can put them into a coma, give them the vaccine, and they can come out of it. But still, you know, rabies is still out there. But do you think there's a matching of flu infects respiratory cells and it's also spread that way? Rabies infects. You know, like, why wouldn't uh, HPV be spread by coughing? Why would? It, why does there seem to be a matching of, again, tropism to again, transmission? It's not really a matching. It's just that the virus found a strategy you know, and it's, they're specialists when it comes to their entry, right? You know, they're, well, special, well, it's a hard one to say, you know, their entry is specialized. And so the, if that receptor is on every cell, then they can infect all those cells. Um, if the receptor is only on a handful of cells, case of HIV, very specialized, only infects CD4 positive cells, has to have the right co-receptor, just so happens that that is a cell type that's just big enough uh, that can replicate itself in perpetuity. Uh, something like COVID-19, you know, ACE2 is a receptor that's found on many different tissue types, including the prostate order. This ACE2 is the highest expressed, right? Um, but it's ma mainly found in all. I mean, there's some ACE2 on most cells. So if you have, if your receptor by chance is on multiple, on many, many different cell types, or there's a protease that can cleave your protein, your spike protein that allows you to enter different cell types or so many cell types, you can wipe a host out. Again, not what the virus I think wants to do. I think it wants to replicate and perpetuity, <laughs> just keep replicating. I think the, the cell death and the death of its host is just completely uh, by accident, you know, or it jumps into a host where, the machinery isn't there to stop it. Ebola is a classic example of that. Like in bat cells, it replicates very slowly. The bat cells resist it. In our cells, it replicates so fast that the cells explode. <laughs> so, you know, um, but in any other scenario, um, that virus would just replicate. I mean, you have, uh, you have other weird uh, viruses like Zika, you know, where it 
you know, most, you know, it's been in Africa since 1950. Uh, and it ha- we haven't seen phenotypes of microcephaly. Um, however, in the South American population, it has caused increased form of microcephaly. And I think that those are starting to work out on why that is. And it's most likely immunological that causes that. But again, it's been in Africa for, you know, we've known it since the 1953, I believe it was found in Africa. We don't see high amounts of microcephaly in African populations. We see it in in kind of uh, South American Latino populations. And so there must be something different about that background uh, that allows for the microcephaly to happen. So um, I think it's just, you know, with viruses, they, if you're... (laughs) You know, if you, you know, I don't think they picked a root initially. I think it's that it, they, if they became respiratory, it's because that protein just happened to be in the respiratory tract, right? Um, okay. that, that they modified or that if they're, you know, or indica- or their blood virus, they electrophic viruses because that's the cell type and the protein that's in blood. And somehow through natural selection evolution, that's the one that they specialized in. So, so what if I have a, uh, if I take a cell and I suck out, a lot of its contents, but I keep the membrane intact with all the receptors and everything. And a virus comes along. How do you think it'll fuse and enter, or do you think at some point during its entry it'll say something's wrong here? And I mean, it'll so definitely that's it'll a problem. Catch and enter. Uh, it'll eject its uh, its components depending on the virus, but that's the end of it. <laughs> you, think you, you, you don't think it'll discern that something's wrong? You no, think? I don't uh, think at all. No, I do not. I think it'll just do its thing and then it'll be like, whoops. And then it'll just sit there, <laughs> you know, you know, in the case of, uh, you know, when we do like single cycle infection of HIV, we, you know, we only get one round of infection because the virus is basically needs two steps in order to move forward. And so you don't get, you get one cycle, you produce virions, but those virions can then go back out and infect again. So, and, and it's because we use the receptor from uh, this thing called the VSV, V, um, that's how the virus enters and it enters through uh, kind of uh, clathrin coated pits. And so we don't put the envelope gene in for HIV. And so it just, you get packaging and you get entry through a different mechanism. And then you get single cycle infections, you get virions, but those virions are, cannot package themselves correctly. So you, you see the effects of the cell and how the cell deals with HIV, but you don't get virions coming off and infecting new cells. You know, um, people are using AI and search for new drugs and search through, you know, billions of different protein confirmations. Do you think you could use, make a biological form of AI where you use viruses to explore, uh, you know, entry mechanisms for a, uh, you know, for a novel bacteria or, uh, you know, use them in some other manner to explore like the possible information space of, uh, you know, are, for a drug? We are modeling phage proteins at raw to actually find new ways to get into cells. And in our case, we're using phage to find new ways to get in because we want to eliminate antibiotic resistance Um, because this is the, you know, we we talk about COVID-19 and that, you know, as officially a million uh, people have died from the disease as of today and over 205,000 Americans have died. You know, one fifth of all the cases that have died have come to the United States and where I think one third of, uh, of all the cases. <laughs> so where are we at with this? So, you know, if you look at multi-drug resistant bacterial infection, we are at a precipice to where we can never come out of <laughs> and that all the drugs that we use will be eventually resistant and in the case of something like C. diff, uh, which kills around 30,000 Americans every year because of the rampant use of things like Z-Packs, we, and as well, agriculture and these other things, uh, we are looking, the WHO suggests that by 2050, uh, if we at the same pace, um, over 10 million people a year will die. And uh, that's a mild estimate. Currently around 700,000 people die every year from multidrug resistant bacteria. And again, we are... We are close to the point where we were in the 1940s, 1930s, where you get a cut on your leg and that's it. You lose the leg or you lose your life. And so phage therapy, there's a lot of startups coming out with phage therapy. You know, there was a brilliant paper that was published in Nature Medicine for a mycobacterial infection that had caused uh, myocarditis in the one person and uh, Graham Hatfield. Uh, they made it basically engineered a phage to go in and kill that bacterium. Uh, we are losing the battle against 
multi-drug resistant organisms, uh, both bacteria and fungi. And so we need uh, to use viruses as our pals to kill these organisms. Um, and, you know, we are creating them in hospitals. We are creating them uh, uh, in agriculture. Um, we are creating them daily. And, you know, uh, if, for example, something like, you know, Yersinia's pestis came back and it was multi-drug resistant, we don't have any workable vaccines <laughs> for Yersinia's pestis. Yersinia's pestis evades vaccination. So, and Yersinia's pestis, the plague bacteria, has killed more humans than any other pathogen known that we yeah. know. Uh, we were lucky enough to eradicate smallpox because we were able to find a vaccine and we wiped it out off the face of the planet. Uh, polio is officially, at least wild polio, is officially free in Africa, but we're still trying to battle polio because the vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. It can kind of mutate out and kind of cause infection. And so we're trying to work that out to where we can eliminate polio. Um, but we need another line of defense. And so what we are trying to do at RAW, we're trying to make a virus that kills multiple different types of multi-drug resistant bacteria or go in and modify uh, those bacteria um, and not bother the other bacteria. The other problem with antibiotics is you go in and you kill the microbiome. It's their bacterial static and you lice the cells and you kill the good guys too. It's like dropping a bomb and killing, you know, both sides. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're killing your people and the and the enemy at the same time. And that's what we do with antibiotics versus like going in with like a, you know, like a SEAL Team 6 and killing the exact guy you want to kill. You know? <laughs> so, and that's where phage come in. They can, they're that SEAL Team 6. They can be designed to be extremely, uh, they get down to the genotype of the organism you want to, if you want it to be specific or if you want it to be broad range. You want it to get rid of all uh, staphylococcus, there's probably ways to do it. But some of those staphylococcus, epidermidis, for example, may or may not cause disease. So we, and we have to play that balance. And I think phage are the, the new wave, I think, of antibiotics. And, and we know nothing about the viruses that infect uh, fungi, very, very little, um, you know, and we don't have, you know, we, you know, there are viruses that like natural killer viruses that kill like, you know, Saccharomyces or stuff like that. But you know, we don't have, we don't really know of any viruses in Candida um, or Cryptococcus or some of these other fungal pathogens. And we have no, uh, and fungi are getting resistant. And food crops, most plants are at the whim of fungi. And so if you look at one of the largest immigration events in the history of the world, it's the, uh, I don't, uh, uh, the uh, Irish potato blight. Yeah. That was caused by fungi, right? So, you know, it may not be a virus directly that kills you, that causes uh, economic collapse. It may be as simple as uh, take all fungi that wipes up all the wheat <laughs> on the right? And so we need a tool in the form of viruses, I believe, uh, to go out and wipe out these pathogens of the other domains, fungi or bacteria. All right, so last, uh, last two questions. One, I know you answer differently than everyone else, but are there any, is there any form of life that does not have any viruses that prey upon it? Oh, well, uh, so the the thought here is about ciliates and I've had more discussions about this and so we've never found a virus in ciliates and I go back to when I was a graduate student at University of British Columbia with Dennis Lin and he was uh, an absolute brilliant scientist a protostologist studied ciliates his whole life this most really bizarre group of eukaryotes and he's a man I miss terribly uh, he was very he was brilliant and he gave some of the most amazing talks about an organism you've never heard of, basically. And so as far as we know, they have non-canonical genetic code and uh, they are not infected by viruses. And I've not found anyone to find a ciliate virus. So one of these days, I will have to go look in pond water, which you can find out by your room. And there's a nature science or a great, great uh, amazing discovery of a virus that's able to have a non-canonical genetic code that can infect Ciliates. And so that is there for someone to take. And so, I, you know, that's one I know. Candidate phyla radiation, these kind of obscure organisms, uh, not really obscure. They seem to be parasites or symbiotes of other of the other domains of bacteria discovered by Jill Banfield. Um, we haven't really found a lot of viruses for them, but I'd imagine that there are some that exist because they're very, very primitive. They have very few, some of them have very, very few genes. 
And so even some of the symbiotes that we find in insects are infected by phage-like elements. So I wouldn't be surprised if we find them there. Yeah, I think, I mean, some of the weird protists, they may, those are the ones that are undiscovered. Most plants have them, most fungi have them. Uh, Candida albicans, uh, we don't know if it has a virus yet or not, but I imagine people have been looking uh, for the longest time. They couldn't find viruses in something like nematodes, like C. elegans. Uh, but they found a virus that <laughs> infects C. elegans. So maybe there is a virus for everything. I don't know. Uh, ciliates seems to be the one that was most elusive. And maybe that's because not a lot of people work on ciliates. So uh, yeah, it has to be there. I imagine it is. And it'd be amazing if it is. And then last question, um, let's say I get an enteric virus. How do you think uh, infected cells, how do you think the microbiome of uh, an infected region of my gut will be versus the normal microbiome? Like, how do you think viruses would change the microbiome? of? Uh, I mean, you know, this is kind of the thought is, you know, kind of out at Stanford, Michael Snyder. So Michael Snyder has made himself kind of, uh, and done a lot of uh, kind of multi-omic experiments on himself as a model system. He basically was infected with RSV. And then after RSV, he developed type two diabetes. And so the thought was, is that the RSV may have helped trigger the immune response that led to his diabetes. I generally think um, that, you know, if you have a massive viral infection or you have any kind of infection or you eat bad food or you're not healthy, this is causes dysbiosis of the gut. And so it's no doubt that you know, if you get it, you know, if you're a, you know, a runner or whatever, or you're an athlete, and then all of a sudden you come down with the flu for two or three weeks, your microbiome is really changed uh, in those two weeks. And that you, it takes you a little bit longer to get back up to speed, but you eventually get back up to speed. I think in people that, you know, if they, you know, there might be viral infections that cause such a, a horrendous thing and dysbiosis of the microbiome that they're kind of off the train tracks. And what do I mean by that? So normally people have, you know, we want to, I want to think of the microbiome and the human health and all that as kind of one, you know, train moving forward. But, you know, viruses or bacterial infections or poor diets or these, other, you know, stress or genetics might push the train off the tracks, leading you off to dysbiosis, which may lead to early death or these other things. So I think that more work in general needs to be done that looks at all of these factors relating to viral infection and then post microbiome dysbiosis. And so I think it's a, it's, a, okay. it's a field that is ripe for amazing discovery. Right on. Well, Rich, thanks for coming again. What, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? They can go to rawmoleculasystems.com. That's probably the best way. <laughs> okay. Well, Rich, thanks again for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's always a pleasure. You take care. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.